My name is Kuju Yangsen. Let me tell you how to turn back time. You can now bring back all the fun, all the excitement, all the controversy of the Super Morning Show and all your favorite joy shows when you go to myjoyonline.com forward slash podcasts. Just select your favorite show and bring it all back again. Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. Radio, radio, Joy 99.7. In our very first story, the latest road safety report by the Accra Metropolitan Assembly has revealed an alarming increase in the number of head injuries from motorcycle accidents in the Accra Metropolis. The report links the injuries directly to the improper use of helmets by motorcycle riders and their passengers. The Assembly, working with the National Road Safety Authority, says they plan to engage riders on the safe use of the roads to reduce crashes. Judith Awachitando has more in the following report. Every month, the Greater Accra Regional Hospital records an average of 102 road crash injuries, amongst which are head injuries. Records from the hospital showed that a number of 168 head injuries were recorded between the months of September and December last year. Emmanuel Lahiable is an emergency medicine specialist at the hospital. So we tried to tease out uh, head injuries associated uh, crashes. So from the chart here, you can see that uh, head injuries are classified as mild, moderate, and severe. So we had 86 of those who were involved in RTA and our crashes uh, been having mild injuries. And we didn't record any mortality. Now if you look at the moderate head injury, about 48 of them sustained moderate head injuries. And three of them, we lost three of them. And the severe head injury, which is more fatal, 34 of them and 11, we lost 11. So in total, 168 uh, head injuries. While authorities strive to reduce road crashes in the city, overspeeding has proven to be a major challenge. Mayor of Accra, Mohamed Ejesua, explains the AMA is working together with the police MTTD to enforce the use of speed limits designated on our roads. It is an undeniable fact that Despite the efforts that we have made in reducing the overspeeding, it is still a big issue for us within the city of Accra. And it's the number one killer that I have observed. Together with the MTTD, together with the MTTD, we are waging war against overspeeding in Accra. The report also highlighted a decline in the correct use of helmets among motorcycle riders. It dropped from 75% to 69% between 2019 and 2020. Similarly, the rate of correctly worn helmets amongst passengers on motorcycles dropped from 45% in 2019 to 25% in 2020. This data, according to the AMA, links to the increasing number of head injuries experienced within our hospitals. Director General of the National Road Safety Authority, Mayo Briebwa, however, says the NRSA is working to increase education on the proper use of the helmet. I think uh, for us, uh, that is where education sanitization comes in and very much in our domain. And so uh, this statistics has even given us more information for us to be able to prove to them. And we've been having uh, pro uh, programs for them. The DVLA right now is also uh, coming out with um, some uh, instructors who will be trained to be able to also train the motorcycles. So we will use that opportunity uh, as part of the models for them to know how to wear the helmets. Judith Awachetando, Joy News. And a Koforidua circuit court has sentenced a 37-year-old taxi driver to 30 months imprisonment for speeding off with an officer of the Motor Transport and Traffic Department of the Ghana Police Service lying on his car bonnet. The convict, Daniel Ofori, 38, has been banned from driving for five years. He was found guilty of two counts of dangerous driving contrary to Section 383 of the Road Traffic Offences Act 2004 and resisting arrest contrary to Section 226 of the Criminal Offences Act 1960. 
Presenting the facts before her honor, Mercy Ade Kote, the prosecuting officer, Inspector Gershon Defiamakbo, said the driver was declared wanted by the police for running away after committing a road traffic offense. He was arrested and charged with dangerous driving and resisting arrest, but was granted bail when he pleaded not guilty. The court, however, found him guilty after more than a year of trial. Now this story will bring smiles to your face because Joy News gets results. Executive Chairman of JL Holdings, Dr. Olene Lindsay, has offered to build a three-bedroom apartment for 13-year-old Moses Adai, featured in our latest hotline documentary, Crushed Young. The documentary, produced by Seth Kwame Boateng, highlighted the devastating impact of road accidents on children and families. Speaking on Eko Sising on Asempa FM, Dr. Olene Lindsay says he wants to give young Moses Adai a reason to smile each day. We'll hear from him shortly, but first, let's bring back excerpts of that documentary. Moses Adey is one of them. On Friday, 19th March, 2021, 13-year-old Moses stepped out to buy food at Treda Junction and has since not returned home. Moses has been on admission at the trauma and orthopedics ward of the Confluence Teaching Hospital for almost six months. I'm <laughs> I am in Kumasi for further information and I get the opportunity to meet the police officers who were first dispatched to the accident scene. This is the exact spot uh, police officers found Moses on the day he was knocked by that taxi. He came to buy food from this woman, um, Gary and Beans. He had finished and he was about boarding a tricycle that brought him when the taxi knocked him. And I understand when the police came, they found pool of blood right here. And I can see from where I am some parts of, I think either the motorcycle or the taxi that knocked him. Police in Treda is trying hard to understand how that taxi could veer off its lane without any obstruction and hit Moses. ESP Dockers Mensa, the Treda District MTTD boss, however, says the investigations have slowed down. The driver was billed and he was asked to be reporting himself. The investigator went to uh, went with the surety to see where to know where he's, he's residing and he went back to the hospital took statement from the victim since he's minor the another statement too was taken from the mother since he's alive he can tell us what exactly what happened at the scene so we are waiting either we can go to the i don't know whether the doctors will allow it but so far as he's now going for another surgery i don't think it will be appropriate for us to move him from the hospital and send him to the scene so we are waiting moses has so far undergone eight surgeries and has two more to do but this pain is not what bothers him the pain from the services he rendered his local church and school which he may not be able to render again. Now let's hear from the executive chairman of JL Holdings, Dr. Orleans Lindsay, who has offered to build a bedroom apartment for Moses Adai. The fact is that I, I don't give because I have in excess, mm. yeah. but because I know exactly how it feels like mm. not to have or wow. to be in trouble. Wow. So I'm guided. The that my principle and mm. not guiding. Mm. Mm. And see, in fact, 
set Martin is now and sin Nipa Damnevuna. I am a wide employee at the Inman in one on one. Dabenti, yet now reception a miniman calote a bobon command a set book him. No can or can a summon na how or can or you so passionate about it until I was touching a mizzy and see ma mukumun something talk to me there. I've, I should take it the mantle on. Wow. And it's not something that mm. to me, yeah. mm. this is what we do. Well, the Deputy Minister for Finance and MP for Ejisu, Dr. John Kuma, has also paid for five different sets of prostheses to be done for Moses and 10-year-old Peter Mensa, who lost both limbs after they were knocked down while heading home. Okay, well, one of them was knocked down while heading home to collect three CDs, printing and studies fee. Three CDs. First, well, producer of that documentary, Seth Kwame Boateng, is in the studio with me. Seth, good morning. Good, good to morning. have you. Yes. Thank All you. right. Well, great results. Um, an apartment um, studio, apartment, apartment for um, Moses, yeah. right? Um, how soon will this project be completed? So, in fact, we cut short for work to begin on the three-bedroom apartment two weeks ago. Okay. So, we even we have contractors on site working as we speak. Okay. Then yesterday, <laughs> Dr. Wait, Lawrence. wait, wait. So, so how, <laughs> there was that initial plan. So, two weeks ago when you cut the source, yes. how were you financing that? We, together with the um, Ecosys Impact Project, we, okay. we have been able to raise around 90000 Okay. So, we were good to go. And people had donated, in fact... The sand and chippings we are using for the construction. Um, this presidential candidate, Akpalu, mm -hmm. provided for free. Wow. All the sand All and the chippings sand for and free. free. We had MP for Inshaya Sustika. He was at the premier last, last week or last two weeks. Last week, he gave us 1,000 blocks that we are using. We've, <laughs> it, it's amazing how okay. people have come in. People rallied support. around exactly. to do that. Okay. Then, Dr. Lindsay. Then two weeks later. <laughs> two weeks later, Dr. Lindsay showed up and it's like, okay, okay, so all the monies you've raised, everything, put everything aside. Use it to do investment for the boy and set uh, his mother up. I'm going to build the three bedroom for free. Wow. And I was like, we already have contractors. I said, well, oh, just call the contractor, give my number to him. I'm going to liaise with him. I'm also going to send my men to support him because we don't want any break. Whatever they will need, we're going to provide. I want, before I came on air, he called. So, get me the number of the foreman on site. I'm wow. sending every single material they need for work to, 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 to start. So, it's amazing the feedback, and I'm happy. And you also mentioned the MP for it. So, yeah. yesterday, it's, I, I was shocked because wow. paying for three, five, five sets, sets of, of prosthesis. prosthesis. Yeah. For the two of them, it's very expensive. Very, very expensive. Because mm, as they're growing, they're going to need exactly. different sizes. And it's going to last them the next 15 to 20, 20 years. years. Wow. And it's amazing. That's so amazing. Yes, yes. That's so amazing. It brings tears to my eyes. <laughs> um, great stuff there. Great work there, Seth. Thank you Thank so you. much um, for joining us. You know, who said we don't get results, oh, we right? we get results. We definitely get results. Thank you so much, Seth, yes. um, for joining us um, with that story. Now, let's move on and meet sellers at the London market in Jamestown for the second time. Failed to impress environmental health officers after failing to correct some unsanitary conditions pointed out to them a month ago. At the re-inspection today, officials issued out another warning to vendors, stressing their shops will be closed down if they fail to remedy the situation. Mamiesi Thompson was with the team and she's filed this report. 
Not much had improved when the Clean Ghana team arrived at the meat shop situated in the heart of the London market at Adedenko. Apart from the painting of the walls and the health screening of sellers, the main surroundings where the meat is sold still needed much improvement. Rubbish was littered indiscriminately and liquids from the meat had dripped all over. Sanitation officers were disappointed. You see how you hang all your clothing? We gave you instruction that you should not be hanging your personal clothing within the shop, the walls here. Because there's the possibility of the clothing having contamination with the meat. So what you need to do is that this place, you have a lottery. Why can't you people take a particular section of the compound here? Then you put cordon it off and they put a wooden structure. Then you direct all your staff. Anybody who comes and you want to change, you have to go and change inside that room. Don't bring any home use dress inside the meat shop. Are you going to do that? I'll come back again. Within three days time, if you count, you see changes. But some meat sellers argued it will be difficult to adhere to the guidelines because the unavailability of water and waste bins were major stumbling blocks. Very, very true because we, we have to get some people who take care about the boiler because formerly we do pay some uh, AM people when they come here. They have to give us some dustbin. So when everything is collected, they have to dump it there. And we get the, uh, this thing. We don't have excess of water here. And that's the, our major problem here. We do not have water here, neither do we have waste bins to dispose of rubbish. It makes it difficult to keep this place neat. So they should help us acquire these facilities, otherwise it will be difficult. Environmental Health and Sanitation Director Joseph Asetanga directs them on what to do, failing which drastic measures will be taken against them. If they have a challenge of getting water, company to restore the water. They should come officially to AME, right, that we need water at the slaughter hub. These are our challenges. We will put up a recommendation letter attached to their request. Until our visit, we were not aware they have water challenges here. They have info. And that day that we came, we asked them to bring a letter, ask them whether they have come up with a letter for us to put up a cover letter to see whether they can restore water for them. And this is still News Desk with me, Enima. Enima, there is still to come pass licentia exam or forget about teaching. The minority says insisting on this is maltreatment of teacher trainees who have spent four years in school studying for the trade. Taking a quick break, we'll be right back. The report came to me. That students didn't do well. They brought me sample responses. And Mr. President, it's important that we, we hold... Um, ourselves accountable to a certain standard that if you want to teach uh, we need to help you welcome back now the minority in parliament says it has for the past three years observed with concern what it refers to as the unfair treatment being meted out to these young trained teachers who have devoted themselves to serve the nation in a capacity that many people have chosen to avoid. According to them, the introduction of the licensure examination has negatively affected teacher trainees. Now, just last week, Education Minister Yao Osei Duchum spoke about how he is unhappy about the high failure rates in the recent licensure examination, despite the lowering of the pass mark. Now, out of the 27,455 candidates who sat for the 2020 teacher licensure examination, 8,872 failed to meet that number. This number represents 30.7% of the total candidates who sat for the exams in October last year. At that interactive session with the leadership of the National Union of Ghana Students, the Education Minister said there was the opportunity for a reset for those who failed. We'll speak to the minority shortly, but first, the Education Minister, Yao Seyedichu. The, they do the main one where all the colleges of education students participate. And then there's another off-season one where uh, those who did not pass will then have opportunity to reset. And then also those who did distance education can then reset. Now the last time, the last one that they did, a report came to me that students didn't do well. They brought me sample responses. And Mr. President, 
it's important that we, we hold um, ourselves accountable to a certain standard. And that if you want to teach, uh, we need to help you uh, to really have the requisite skills to teach. I, I don't want to even talk about the pass mark which was set. It was brought so low, yet some people did not bring the cut. Uh, those who were doing reset, um, some of them were able to make it. Those who did it for the first time, um, about 78% were able to pass three. Sorry, two out of the three, 78%. But if you look at those who passed all the three for the first time, it was about 23%. And they have opportunity to sit again and be able to pass it, just like those who did reset and was able to make it. So I had a discussions with the NTC, National Teaching Council, and another exam is coming up. I also instructed that they need to have a web portal with thousands of questions for people to have the opportunity to practice, because you don't want people to walk into an exam to do it and they ha don't have the benefit of sample questions that they can use to prepare for the exam. So NTC have taken it up as a responsibility to make sure sample questions are available and that they can even do a sample, just like we prepare for exams anywhere in the world. You really have to give them something. Now, there have been calls for a review or abolition of the policy, but the government says it has come to stay. The minority has issued a statement. Dr. Clement Park is MP for Bills of South and the minority spokesperson on education. He joins us on the telephone. Good morning, Dr. Clement Park, and welcome to DESK. Yes, good morning to you and to viewers and uh, listeners. Uh, <laughs> just a quick one. I'm the deputy ranking member on the committee okay. for education. Yes, But yes. of course, I am one of the spokespersons when it comes to matters of uh, education for the party and then our, our side in parliament. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much for that clarification and we appreciate your time this morning. Let's dive straight into it. So my first question, a part of your statement reads, and I quote, what is frustrating is that after the teacher trainees have gone through a three-year program and having to obtain a number of credits to qualify as teachers, a six-hour aptitude test or examination is conducted to determine their professional competence. The question one asks is that can a six-hour examination correct or rectify any inadequacies or inefficiencies in the teacher that a three-year program of study could not correct? Let's begin with you answering that question for us, Doc. Well, first of all, we have said, and we would say again, and as captured in our 2020 manifesto, that... The teacher licensure exam, as it is currently structured, is not useful. We say so because we don't believe that it ought to be the case that students would go and train for three good years in teacher training colleges. Pass every single exam and then after they are done they are then tested again as we said only six hours based on an aptitude test before they are then deemed ready or qualified or capable of teaching when we are in dire need of thousands of teachers when we have invested colossal amounts of money to train them, feeding them, giving them an allowance. So from the onset, we have said that, look, there is no reason why, even if we are to have a licensing process, it cannot be done within the context of the structures available at the teacher training colleges. There is no reason why these processes of licensing them cannot become part of the curriculum for them to go through that process 
just as they do with all the other subject areas that they have to go through to qualify to become teachers rather than this six hour aptitude test. So economically, it doesn't make sense. Practically, it is defeatist because we train teachers, expend monies, and then they have to sit home because they didn't pass a six hour test. And in fact, it is not also fair to the students and their parents. I mean, think about how it feels to have to go through all of that. So we are raising the legitimate questions that we raised before. And I think that everyone listening to us genuinely, if we were to compare the alternative that we are proposing to what is happening, Ours is much more humane and realistic and allows for free flow for them to finish and go and start teaching. We need them in the classrooms. That is why we are investing in them. So they can make a living, support their families, and then teach our world. Right. There are many schools across the length and breadth of this country struggling to have teachers. Okay. Um, Dr. Park, let me move on to, to my next question. So the minority have said that it is maltreatment to insist that the teachers pass the exam. Um, based on what then will they teach our children? Because if you argue um, that this six hour you know, aptitude test is not a, a good reflection, a good indicator of what they've learned, knowing the curriculum of what they've learned and assuming that based on that curriculum, the questions were set, what are you asking then that um, the foundation for their teaching be built on? Well, you don't, as we said in our statement, you cannot use a six-hour aptitude test to conclude that somebody who has gone through three years of rigorous training, including practical, doesn't qualify to teach. That is the point we are making. In any case, if, that is, if, if, if government is using this aptitude test to suggest that many of the products of the teacher training colleges are not fit for purpose. Is it not an indictment on government itself and the Ministry of Education? Doesn't that suggest that there are challenges as far as these same teacher trainees are concerned in the institutions that train them? And whose responsibility is it to fix that? Dr. Park, Dr. Park, I just want to ask um, this, this question. So doctors, for example, write exams, you know, when they finish medical school. Um, the lawyers, after they've been trained, have to write the bar exam, for example. Nurses have to write an exam. You know, we have professional exams. So, so what exactly is the problem if, you know, after you've trained for three years, there's a standard licensing exam that you have to write? The question that I really want you to clarify for me um, is that are these teachers being asked to write an exam that is outside the scope of their training? Is that what the problem is? Because if well, it isn't, then they should be able to answer the questions. if they are not doing questions. well, as we are being told, <laughs> I mean, something is not right. I don't set the question. I don't greet them. But given the, uh, the, 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 the lamentations of the minister himself, that means that something is not right. And we ought to look at that. And our position in the minority is not that exams should not be written. We are not saying that teachers should not be licensed. We are saying that that can be done within the context of the structures already available at the teacher training colleges. And we are also saying so because in the case of the teacher trainees becoming, you know, teachers assigned jobs to go and teach, it is not just the issue of the licensure exam. It is also the compulsory National service, where we also think that it is also another waste of time when we need them in the classrooms. They do practicals for one year, for God's sake. That should be classified and used as their national service. We need them. And so anything that is going to prevent us from getting use of teachers, anything that is going to keep teachers at, away from the classroom, we ought to address them and look at ways that we can still you know, 
make sure that they are adequately prepared, but in a way that is not going to impact the nation negatively in terms of their unavailability in the classrooms. Dr. Park, um, you know, the, the unavailability issue, it, it worries me a little bit because are, are we... I would like to believe that you're not in any way saying that we should compromise on quality because teachers are so largely responsible for the future of our nation in that they are teaching our children. Um, so should the focus not be fixing their education so that they are actually equipped to pass these exams as opposed to scrapping the exams totally just because they're not passing it? You see, you are misunderstanding the argument of the minority. Okay, please explain and it I would suggest me. that you take another look at the statement. I have what looked at the statement. What we are proposing is another medium of testing them and certifying them. And Dr. Park, before you continue, there's also the claim that it was actually the NDC that initiated this idea of the licensure exams. But then yes. lost power in 2016, so you the weren't idea, able yes. to implement but it. The, the idea that we had was not to have a separate entity called the NTC administering an exam mm. outside of the confines of the already existing structures in the colleges of education. Okay. So the idea that we had in terms of the way it should be done is exactly what we have contained in our manifesto. It's exactly what is contained in our statement. So the idea, yes, and that is why we are not opposed to licensing teachers. It is the mode and the method by which it is being done that we are opposed to. Okay, so are you um, suggesting, or would the NDC's plan have been to put together the credits from the training college and then license these teachers, or would the NDC have wanted these exams? What, what exactly would the minority have done in this situation? The processes of certifying them would have become part of their training. Right. They will write all the other exams, and because they are being trained to become professionals, there will be a separate program that they would all have to take, after which they will write, then write the exam. And they be, on the basis of that, right. which okay. we expect them to pass, they will be licensed. Okay. Now remember that in the minister's statement, mm -hmm. the minister himself is attributing the mass failure to the lack of preparing them for the Lansantia exam. He is even talking about making past questions available to them. Right. Which means our alternative would have solved all of these problems because they would have been taken through a program and then they would write the exam, like all the other, ex uh, the other papers that they would write. So are, you going to, school. so are you going to invite the minister to, you know, have a sort of discussion with him and maybe put your suggestions across? Actually, I would not because the, the ministry at this government, they never pay heed to all the pieces of advice that we give them. Mm, I see. It has been there, we've spoken about it, it's now manifesto. They choose to do it their own way, and that is the way they've always acted. So I wouldn't waste my time engaging the minister or the ministry. Our role is to put out these issues and let Ghanaians know that they have alternatives. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for joining us this morning, Dr. Clement Apak. Thank you for your time. Now, let's move on to the Ashanti region. And the Ashanti Regional Police Command has arrested two suspects to aid in the investigation of a... Uh, 45-year-old palm wine tapper, the murder of a 45-year-old palm wine tapper. Now, the deceased, Yao Kwachi, he armed himself with a single-barrel gun and stormed into a distillery at Trinisu Number 1 community to demand his distillery pipe from a colleague. A struggle ensued between the deceased and two others and allegedly resulted in the shooting to death of Yao Kwachi. Here is a report on the crime situation in that region. The police at Francis say an argument ensued between the deceased, Yao Kwache, and William Frempon. A gun warded by Yao Kwache accidentally triggered, leading to his death. Suspects William Frempon and Kwesiapia have since been arrested by the police as part of investigation. Ashanti Region Police PRO, ASP Godwin Ahianyo, explains. Police have since arrested the two suspects to assist in our investigation while the body of the deceased has been deposited at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital mortuary for preservation and autopsy. The regional crime scene team had also been at the scene for reconstruction at the crime scene. 
Police at Ebuaka on Tuesday also picked the body of a man suspected to be in his early 20s dead at Daba. It is suspected he was lynched on suspicion of theft. In this very case, preliminary investigation has also disclosed that at about 12.50 a.m. on the same day, some unidentified persons pursued him as an alleged thief, subjected him to beatings, tied him and then fastened him with a vehicle and put him to a location where he was later found dead. The police is making frantic effort to get the perpetrators arrested. On Tuesday, police rescued 24-year-old Michael Akwesi Ajiman from being lynched for attempted kidnapping of a five-year-old. He has been arrested and named his accomplice. The suspect during questioning admitted the offense and mentioned one Eric as the one who contracted him to kidnap the said child. He, however, could not lead police to arrest the said Eric. He is also detained to assist in investigation. The police at Asqua have also arrested three persons, namely Malik Isaka, Richmond Amankwa and Isaac Obi for attacking a mobile money vendor of 18,000 cities at Pramso. ASP Ahiano says efforts are being made to arrest a fourth suspect. When police went to the crime scene, three empty shells of an AK-47 assault rifle were retrieved at the scene. We believe the fourth person who is on the run might have escaped with the AK-47 assault rifle. We are making all efforts to get him arrested. To deal with the increasing crime, the police have embarked on a series of swoops. The 44 police districts within the region have embarked on series of swoops. I mean separate swoops within the past week and we've been able to arrest 522 suspects. We are profiling the suspects, photograph them, we create an album. So anytime we go back again and we get them arrested, those who be found culpable will be made to face the full rigors of the law. For Joy News, Nane Ojima reporting. Okay, so an estimated amount of over $200 million have been lost to railway theft in the country. According to Deputy Minister for Railways, Kweku Asante Boating, it costs $5 million to construct a kilometer of railway line, estimating that over 60 kilometers have been stolen across the country. A few which have been retrieved are not fit for purpose. Mr. Boating says efforts to revive the sector is being negatively affected by the present situation. He's been touring affected areas in the Ashanti region. is to sensitize the public on the happiness on railway assets. As you could see behind you, we have a lot of the lines which have been cut by thieves. They use welding machines to cut the line and sell a scrap. This is the situation we find ourselves in. When we came into power, His Excellency Nanado Danko Akufuado realized the need for us to revamp the railway sector. And let me tell you, for a fact, to construct one kilometer of a rail is costing this nation an amount of five million dollars to construct just one kilometer. And if we are to construct, let's say, 100 kilometers of rail, it will cost this nation not less than $500 million. If you convert that into our currency, you can imagine. We know for sure that for the past 20 years, we haven't seen 
any train running on our rails. Um, the industry is gone down and we are trying to revamp it. But this is not to say that the old trucks are not good. When you go to Sekendi Takradi, there are some trains still running on the old lines. We're using it to cut manganese and both sides. Although we don't have a lot of coaches and other things to run economically, so that people will say, but what I'm trying to say is that when we came to power, we have developed a master plan that will bring back the old train system that we all knew or well know. And now our government is doing a lot. We haven't gotten here. That's why we haven't seen. But even for Kumasi, we've awarded a contract for David Water to start the a new line from KJTR here to Kasi. And we are on the verge of awarding another contract to continue to Obuasi. But Let's speak to Nanaya Jima, who is on tour with the Deputy Minister, and he's joining us by phone, via phone, sorry. Nanaya, good morning. How are you? I'm doing very well. Great stuff. Okay, so Mr. Boating revealed plans to engage the steel industry. Now, do you have any idea of what these plans are? So the strategy is that if government is able to cut demand for these um, steel or railway lines, obviously there will be an impact on the supply. Therefore, if government is able to get in touch with the steel companies who take these um, lines for their work uh, to to um, desist from buying from these sources. Obviously, the, the people who are engaging in certain activities will not be encouraged to go ahead and steal these railway lines for sale. So the government would want to engage these companies and try and find a way of ensuring that they cut demand from their end to, um, to discourage the people who steal these lines from going ahead with um, what they do. Um, now, the, according to the minister, there are some people who have already been picked up, and some of them have, they, they have been able to be sentenced uh, by the police, uh, by the court, and um, due to the act. There are others who are still in police custody, and they are going through the legal process. So government would want the general public to help cooperate and um, inform the police about some of these um, tests going on on our various railway lines to ensure that... Um, this is brought to an end and help government to revive the sector. Right, okay, that sounds good. So from the Ashanti region, where are you heading to? The minister will be um, visiting parts of the eastern region where the um, lines are also being um, cut for sale. And also um, from there, we, we hope that the minister is able to give us the way forward for the ministry uh, in dealing with such a situation. But so far, he's been able to engage some um, the district police at Joso, and they've, they they talk some strategy to help the government um, deal with people who have been stealing such um, a property. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Nana Aljima, for joining us, and you stay safe out there. Now, still on business, government will not hesitate closing down community mining sites that failed to adhere to mining regulations. That's according to Deputy Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, George Mekuduka. A visit to some sites revealed some licensed community miners are yet to put in place structures and safety precautions despite commencement of gold extraction. Nana Aljima, again, has more on the following. The community mining system is set up as alternative livelihood for illegal miners following renewed efforts in fighting Galamthi. It is said to be a miniature of large-scale mining firms. Under the system, the government, as owner of the gold deposits, invests in the mine through interested business individuals. Locals with interest in mining are then registered and authorized to mine their allotted concessions under certain safe conditions. Under this operation, office structures, first aid facilities, washrooms, among others, are to be constructed for miners. Mr. Duka warns refusal of miners to comply with all the regulations 
could result in operational shutdown. Well accepted by the commission. And in a month's time, we will come back and ensure whether or not you are following all the protocols in mining. And we are serious about this. Yes, we've seen the concession, but I'm not happy about the environment. So let's put the environment in order. Thank you very much. Thank you. He spoke at a ceremony to inaugurate the community mining site at Edukrum in the Ahafuano South East District. This community mining is expected to help provide jobs and reduce illegal mining in forest areas. Joseph Ajemandapa is District Chief Executive. <laughs> As a representative of the president, I am supposed to create jobs for the youth. That is why we formed an association of chiefs and queen mothers to find a way of achieving that. Our timber in this area is exhausted and not all the youth are interested in farming. Farming is not as lucrative as it used to be. So we have to take steps to activate this mine. All right, we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, everything you need to know about the Champions League with Oweku. Don't go anywhere. Okay, so we have everything that you need to know about um, the Champions League. So, Orex, fill me in. What's popping? <laughs> it's, it's one of those, those days when you're a football fan, a bit of a uh, mixture of anxiety, mm -hmm. and you know, you look for it to as well. It's the Champions League group stage draw, and teams will be finding out who they'll be facing in you know, the most elite club competition uh, available. So, uh, just a bit of a brief there will be four pots because you know, 32 teams qualify, okay. and after this, we'll have the round of 16. But there'll be four pots. Pot one is where the so-called giants are. So it has the okay. holders, uh, that's Chelsea, who are the defending champions. And then it has the Europa League winners as well, Villarreal. Okay. Remember, Manchester United missed out on that. They could have mm. been in pot one. And then it has the rest of the league winners in the top five leagues. Okay. And so it's, uh, it's for the big guys. Okay. And what pot one is, is that, you know, you're trying to avoid the giants meeting each other. At the and, beginning Yeah, stages. so you want to put all of them in one group. And then they'll be getting opponents from pot two, pot three, and pot four. Now... Surprisingly, last season, we had a season where most of the big teams didn't win their leagues. Wow. And so they've all moved that to Pot 2. That should be two. interesting. So okay. yeah, you can see Pot 2 there with Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juventus, Man U, Paris Saint-Germain, Liverpool, Sevilla and Dortmund. Wow. Yes, so okay. we're going to see a lot of, uh, of big, big games, yeah, yeah, big games the in the group stages. Oh, and nice. so the only restriction right now is that teams from the same association cannot face each other. So mm -hmm. you cannot see Chelsea and Liverpool in one group. Ah, but that okay. means Chelsea can draw Real Madrid, PSG, Barcelona, Juventus, oh, Sevilla or Dortmund. They can draw ah. Manchester United as well. So that's what we do have. And the remaining no pot three, pot four is dependent on your coefficients in Europe. That's how well you've performed in history. Mm -hmm. And so a team like AC Milan's in pot four because this is their first time going to a Champions League in what, close to seven years. And so their coefficient is quite low. So they're in the lowest pot available. I see. Look, that sounds good. Um, it's at 5 p.m. Yeah, it's at 5 p.m. in Istanbul, Turkey. And guess who will be coordinating the draw? Just, oh, just, cool. just last week we had a Samojan doing the calf draw. This time around we have Michael Asia. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's well, Ghana to the world. Ghana to the world. Well, I'm sure you'll be available to give us all the details as it's happening. Yeah, we'll actually be doing uh, more analysis on, on sports today okay. uh, on the Join News channel. And then at 4.30 p.m. when Pulse comes your way, would get you ready into for the draw, which well. happens at 5 p.m. But just a bit of a statistic for you and the Chelsea fans out there. Last year, we had a Chelsea legend coordinating a draw and Chelsea won the Champions League. 
I don't need to tell you I'm about just Michael Asian coming eyes. back this oh year. Oh my God, I'm just going to roll my eyes and move on. Thank you so much for thank that. Thank you too. And thank you to you for staying tuned in. Um, thank you so much for sharing your morning with us. Coming up next is Joy News Interactive. Remember, all the news that you need is on myjoyonline.com. My name is Enimwa Enimwa. I'll see you tomorrow morning.